July, Independence Day, so US market holiday today, so we'll talk about that a bit more uh, in this briefing, but overall, in summary, to keep in mind, the calendar will be very front-loaded today, as to will likelihood be the market movement and activity, because US markets are closed today for that holiday, and you have reduced electronic trading hours. Uh, and so you just need to be, I guess, a little bit more realistic about what you're going to get out of today's session, especially once European cash equity markets close at 4.30 London time. Uh, but let's just take a quick look at what we had yesterday because a uh, very interesting day and you know, despite the fairly unpresidential type tweets coming out of Donald Trump at the weekend, I did catch a tweet on my way home where Trump was saying, uh, Dow all time highs again. I bet the fake news agencies won't report that. Uh, there's no kind of stopping the guy at this moment about voicing his opinion, but uh, he was correct all-time highs again in the US. Uh, and you can see here, looking at the S&P in the center right, uh, another little kind of blip higher as we had some pretty decent data yesterday. And the open on Wall Street just pushed up onto the upside, breaking the, the high that was seen towards the latter part of the session from last week. Um, just recapping some of the data points though because there had been a little bit of uh, I would say coming off the best levels in terms of US economic data of late uh, and what we had or what we have had in two of the most recent uh, important US economic data readings is some really strong numbers coming out of the states. Uh, first of all, if you remember, we had the Chicago PMI number. That was incredibly strong, 65.7. Uh, that was the highest reading since May of 2014. Uh, four of the five breakdown of the components. So when you talk about new orders, production, those types of things, they were all up. Uh, and it was way above expectations uh, of 58. I mean, just looking at this chart here, you know, it's a phenomenal jump that we've had. Usually the month-to-month -month changes are much more incremental than what we had on that particular time round. Then if you look at yesterday, we had the ISM. So this is the Purchasers Managers Index for the US. That again came in at 57.8. Expectations were for 55.2. That doesn't sound like a lot, but statistically that's a very large beat, I'd say, for this particular data set. And that does mark as well uh, the reading pointed to the strongest rate of expansion since August of 2014. Output, new orders and employment all grew faster. And so a phenomenally strong number again and just peaking above you can see this high print that we had in February of this year but certainly in an about turn from slight softening that we had seen uh, emerge in both April and May. So some really strong data coming out of the States and that probably helped lift a little bit of this equity sentiment. Uh, obviously last week we had some first days where some selling pressure emerged at the Wall Street Open and actually carried through all the way to the Wall Street close which as we've seen over the last few months is quite unusual because what we've tended to see is a recovery late in the Wall Street session. But that wasn't really happening last week as a lot of the central bank rhetoric started to turn ever more hawkish. So not just the Fed on their kind of normalization process, we've got the Bank of England, the ECB and so on turning more hawkish. But what we've seen then is a bit of recovery as well, not only in the equity market, but also for the dollar. A pretty bad week for the dollar last week. This was because of, as we just mentioned, a surprising turn, most notably by the other Western major central banks. Um, the Bank of England's Mark Carney turning more hawkish, uh, as too was Draghi in that centrist speech, has meant that we've played a bit of catch up, if you like, in uh, converging of monetary policies. The Fed already on the, on the path, the interest rate hikes and talking about timelines for balance sheet tightening, but this now talk of potential rate rises or uh, removal of accommodative stance in the case of the ECB has closed that gap and what you've seen then um, is a bit of reversal of that move I'd say from what we had last week so dollar strength yesterday also probably helped by the data 
in addition. And that's just meant that these both these major pairs have come off a little bit, looking at euro dollar here from where we were. Um, you know, this was obviously the point of the Draghi speech when he sounded very kind of bullish on the prospects of the outlook on the European economy. He kind of rose there ever higher through 114, getting close to an approach on 115 on the upside. Um, we had that brief momentary spike lower. You can see defined by that wick. wick. That was that ECB source comment. And then we are here, we've paired probably two thirds of that initial move, finding some support on the daily pivots on the S1 thus far. So we're sitting close tight around the 114 handle. Now on this note, there was, uh, I was off the desk at the time, but late yesterday afternoon, we had a, some ECB sources. Um, so this came from Reuters. And I would say in terms of the timing, this isn't unusual. Given that the euro is at these very multi-month high elevated levels, what you tend to see is the propensity for the ECB to want to communicate so that there's complete transparency of the direction they want the market to be priced in. So that there's, it's in sync, if you like, between what the central bank want to telegraph and how the market is positioned. And what you could argue is, given this really sharp appreciation of the currency, what's happened is the central bank have used sources, like yesterday, in order to temper some of this expectation about this overtly hawkish response that the market has seen from what Draghi said last week. What the sources said yesterday then was that unnerved by markets, ECB rate setters are wary of a July move so spooked by a market backlash, some ECB policymakers are having doubts about signalling in July whether they are moving closer to dialing back their easy money policy. So it's kind of a little bit like saying, yes, we're going to err uh, towards tapering at some point in the future, but it's more about a soft taper rather than an outright taper, if that makes sense. So they're kind of playing down the scale of the aggressiveness of the hawkish tones that emerged from last week. Uh, so hence that in combination with a bit of a resurgence in the dollar uh, on the back of the firm data and we've just seen a bit of a pullback in the, the currency pair uh, over the last kind of 24 hours or so or certainly the last 12 hours. Cable likewise uh, more I'd say a story of dollar movement rather than really explicitly that of the British pound seeing movement. You can see here this really firm upward trend and then we had the speech from Carney uh, which after I would say mixed signals from him being firstly dovish then turning hawkish he kind of clarified that when he was on that panel speech in Portugal last week we rallied thereafter and again this is more I would say the pound still up on the back of this more hawkish turn but just coming off the best levels that we saw towards the end of last week amid some of the, the movement in the dollar predominantly yesterday. You can see that double top now forming a pretty significant level on the upside to be mindful of uh, if we were to get all the way back up to in excess of that 130 handle again. But looking short to dated in terms of the prospects for the pound today, uh, as we just mentioned, it is of course a, a North American holiday. And so I'd say probably looking for more of a range bound situation barring any unexpected comments on say possibly the Brexit situation or domestic politics on Theresa May and the Conservative Party but really not really expecting too much on that at this particular point in time. So looking at really pivot as a, a pretty notable level on the upside that also just four pip shy of the 130 kind of round figure and then on the downside uh, you've got the early kind of morning low that we printed at 29.52 uh, then followed by S1. So again this today's all about kind of having realistic targets on any trades that you're wishing to enter uh, with the mindset that really the market might not move too much uh, given the, the lack of participation from the North American participants today. Uh, quite a few other things though, just to get you up to speed on from a, a news perspective. And one thing, this isn't particularly market moving, but it just goes to show 
the kind of power of technology and its influence into financial markets at the moment. And I'm not sure if you read about this, but there was a glitch on the NASDAQ aftermarket last night. <laughs> Basically, what happened was one of the exchanges was sending some test data that had specifically a price point that affected stocks to reprice to the value equally of $123.47. Now, that's fine if you're eBay or Microsoft and you're trading well below $123.47. In fact, in terms of Microsoft, their shares jumped almost 80% momentarily. However, look at Amazon. Amazon got absolutely killed on the back of an erroneous um, message that was sent out by the exchange. Now, the exchange actually discarded the test data and removed all trades, uh, but it just goes to show uh, for if you were checking, I guess, if you were a holder in one of these stock prices and you would have checked on your mobile phone on the way home and saw your Amazon shares down that much, I'm sure you would have had a momentary heart attack thinking what on earth has just happened. Um, but quite often when you see such an erroneous print, really it can only be explained by exactly that, an error on the, on the behalf of the exchange or the actual quality of the order data. And what tends to happen then is the orders get what's called busted by the exchange in, in that essence. But uh, quite interesting to see that even in this modern day and age, the exchange putting through some, some kind of test data actually led to this type of price movement. Uh, and what tends to happen is obviously if there's a large number of big market cap stocks that have a very quick flash kind of crash to the downside, then the circuit breaker of the exchange will kick in and, and all the stocks get halted. Um, but just quite interesting to see that was that happened last night. Moving elsewhere, let's have a look at the the Australian currency, because that certainly has seen some movement um, overnight. So this is the uh, the Australian dollar slides as the RBA declines to give hawkish hints. So the Australian dollar was falling as trading got underway in Europe following Reserve Bank of Australia's decision to hold rates pat, so unchanged rates. They shied away from any recent trend of increasing hawkish comments from other central bankers. Don't forget, last week we saw what many might believe to be actually a coordinated um, move on a global scale to actually start to shift the next kind of phase of recovery from the post-financial crisis era. And that is moving in step, the likes of the Bank of England, the ECB, the Fed and so on, to move towards being less dovish, if you like. And so that's almost set a precedent for other central banks. Will they, the question is, follow suit? So a lot of people probably would have been heading into this RBA decision thinking, okay, that's fine. The RBA are not going to change interest rates. We know that. But what is it that they say? What's the tone in the accompanying statement, which was key? And actually, they refrain from making anything hawkish in terms of commentary. And so what you can see here, this is the Aussie future. So the Aussie immediately shot lower, straight through on its daily S1 and S2, and breaking back below what was kind of a, a point of resistance that defined really much of June, uh, both on the 14th, the 19th, the 21st, and the 27th, and we've broke below there. You can see we tried to recover a little bit this morning, got pretty much back up to that level, that aforementioned level at 76.17 and then we've just moved back down towards the lower points sitting on the one on the 76 handle at the moment so pretty punchy move in the Aussie overnight and again this is kind of a lack of hawkish signals given in the commentary from the RBA uh, decision elsewhere the other headline that you've probably read about is this one North Korea missile launch fueling regional tensions and so North Korea firing another ballistic missile off the east coast, a move that threatens to further heighten tensions in the region. This, of course, has come on the eve of the US Day of Independence. Uh, I also think it was a military uh, anniversary as well in terms of North Korea on Monday, which we know they, they tend to have a, 
um, a routine of showing aggressiveness on those particular landmark days. They kind of flex their muscles and show their military might, if you like. Uh, and this actually is now the 11th test, uh, missile test from North Korea since the 2017 began. Uh, so we're seeing the frequency pick up substantially the number of tests that North Korea uh, is carrying at the moment. Now what was interesting about this particular missile test, if we look at the map to give you a bit of an idea, uh, is that this particular missiles that they're firing are tending to be more and more longer ranged missiles. Um, and so uh, this particular ballistic missile greatly exceeded the altitude of two and a half thousand kilometers. It had a distance that it covered to hit what was a target in the Sea of Japan, the East Sea of 900 or just over 900 kilometers. So again, if you start to look in the terms of the geography of the area of the Korean Peninsula, uh, China and then Japan on the right hand side, certainly uh, a range of knocking on a thousand kilometers brings into definite focus uh, geographic kind of landmass of of Japan but certainly the hotly contested waters here uh, that would be Japan's exclusive economic zone as far as they are concerned. What does this lead to then? Well it brings about real stern questions about what will be the response from the likes of Japan. Obviously the missiles have been fired in their direction. This then brings about the geopolitics side of well Japan is closely allied to the USA so what has Trump had to say? Well, certainly he won't miss out on getting a tweet out in response. He said, North Korea has launched another missile. Does this guy have anything better to do with his life? Question mark. Hard to believe that South Korea and Japan will put up with this much longer. Perhaps China will have a heavy move on North Korea and end this nonsense once and for all. So Trump being as vocal as ever, I guess, in terms of um, saying that this has been the tact of the last few months, making a pretty strong signal to China that if you do not take care of the situation, we are willing to intervene. Now, personally, I think this is all uh, aggressive word tactics in order to get China to, to take care of this situation. Would the US step in and deal with North Korea directly? I how highly doubt it. Because China, given as we can see here in the map, is adjoined land-wise to Korea on the north border. This is very key part of land as far as the protection for China historically coming in from this particular kind of northeast area. They would definitely not want US intervention militarily in this situation that would hugely disrupt the relationship between China and the USA. Trump knows it, China knows it, and North Korea probably know it as well. But certainly that won't stop the escalation of how far can this blinksmanship go is the question. Now, the other part of this, obviously, like we said, Japan is the country in question here. And the one um, thing to remember is Japan is closely aligned to the USA in regards to military backing and so at the moment they are sub US military submarines sat just off the south southern Korean peninsula as well as US naval bases situated in the southern part of Japan so hence the reason why you can see that these situations can um, pick up quite quickly if they were to escalate now important thing to recognize here is has it moved the market well a lot of people have been talking about a little bit of yen strength so this is dolly yen we did have a little bit of a move lower so obviously there was a record high close on wall street yesterday some strong um, u.s data overall sentiment was fairly robust going into the chinese session or asia pack session we moved higher so a bit of yen weakness dollar strength general risk on then the situation happened with the test fire of the missile the yen appreciated a little bit but has recovered since 
And I would say a lot of this is to do, as we just mentioned, this is the 11th test that they've done in seven months. And it's almost if I think the market is starting to desensitize slightly to the regularity of these types of events. Now, what you'd probably need is escalation. Military confrontation would take this certainly to the next level. Uh, but whether we'd get that far, I think, is probably doubtful. But to be monitored, I would say. Leading on to this, the other thing that's going to be very interesting, of course, is for one, uh, I, I will see if I can get hold of the time, but the Russian, um, so Vladimir Putin, is meeting the Chinese president today. Very interesting to see what their conversations will be like. This, of course, comes before the end of the week where you'll have the G20 summit. And quite interestingly, some of the things that the press are running this morning is talking about how it's actually Germany and China that are kind of taking the mantle, if you like, and leading this G20 kind of summit. It's taking place in Germany. Uh, I believe it's taking, it begins at the end of the week. But it's going to be obviously really interesting when the G20 happens because then you've got all of the major players there. Uh, so you've got now almost a new united front from Europe with France and Macron and Germany and Merkel. You've then got China, Putin, and then, of course, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump. It will be very interesting to see how he holds his own in this environment against the other major leaders. We'll see if whether he pushes the next high-ranking senior official out of the way like he did uh, in the recent summit we had in Brussels. We shall see. Okay, so quick look at the calendar. Uh, there is not a great deal on the docket for today. Uh, you can see later on this morning for sterling traders you've got construction PMI but I'd say of the three major PMI readings that we have we had manufacturing yesterday which was slightly weaker than expected. Then we've got construction and we'll have the services reading on Wednesday, tomorrow. Don't forget, construction is probably the smallest component of the trio of PMA, PMI data that we see. And so by default, it will likely have the smallest underlying impact on the pound. But nonetheless, I would certainly keep an eye on that number going into, obviously, Brexit talks, future uncertainty for the economic environment in the UK. One would think that construction should start to tail off like manufacturing showed yesterday, which was weaker than expected in the UK. The important number, though, in, in this context is certainly the service number, which will come on Wednesday. You've also got the FPC minutes. These are very rarely market moving. This is kind of the, the subsidiary of the Bank of England, not to be um, confused with the MPC, which, of course, is the Monetary Committee, which is the more important one. Then we've got the Eurozone PPI numbers, possibly interesting from a inflationary perspective. Um, but then that's pretty much it. You've got uh, ECB speaker taking part in a panel discussion at 1.30. But otherwise, we are going to be expecting it to be a fairly quiet day. So I guess identifying key technical levels and maybe looking for range type trades could be uh, the mo more prudent view to carry on a day like today and I think having realistic targets for your trade don't be looking for the kind of home run on a day like today it's unlikely to happen and the longer we get in toward the afternoon probably uh, the more propensity that the market will go into sideways fashion uh, the one thing of course to be wary of is any unscheduled news so of course be mindful keep an update on um, news as and when you hear it when it's coming out on the score box Okay guys, it's your morning briefing. Have a good day. Any questions, uh, feel, feel free to uh, leave them in the chat room. Be happy to help. Thank you very much.